so the uh, Evil Twin debate series is founded on the notion um, that there are experts out there like Artie and Scott um, that are at loggerheads on issues. Um, <laughs> let's talk it up, right? So loggerheads um, at issue, um, uh, but are friendly. Um, and we want to get them together um, in a room with our friends and <laughs> colleagues um, to talk about issues that are substantive in nature, but do it in a lighthearted um, tone. Um, and so today, the lightheartedness starts very quickly. The debate topic is death squad or rubber stamp. Um, I kind of twisted that one. I have to admit that was like um, the PTO's role in patent validity. Um, as we'll hear momentarily, um, there are um, questions about what is the PTO's kind of proper role in setting and enforcing um, patent law and patent policy. There are also, as always, questions about where does the administrative state sit. Um, in our kind of innovation policy uh, framework. And so to um, discuss this, we have our evil twins. I never disclose which one um, is the evil one of the other. Um, <laughs> leave that up to the participants um, uh, to figure that out. Um, Artie Rye from Duke Law School and Scott Keith at George Washington Law School. Um, Artie will get 15 minutes to set up the issue and kind of present her um, side um, of, of the issue. And then Scott will get 18 minutes. Um, to present his position, and then Artie will get three minutes for rebuttal, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, now, uh, per evil twin um, tradition, um, we will have some biographies read, um, but I asked uh, the other <coughs> twin to write the other twin's biography. Uh. <laughs> so the idea here is, is that Artie um, got a hand at drafting Scott's bio, and Scott got a hand at drafting Artie's um, bio. So, uh, uh, and then they give it to me to read. So I, I, you know, I, I, I distance all this. <laughs> but, um, Artie's bio, Scott. The Honorable F. Scott Keefe is the Fred C. Stevenson Research Professor of Law at GW Law School in D.C. He specializes in international trade and business, intellectual property, and I trust finance and securities regulation, bankruptcy biotechnology and medicine, <laughs> governance and compliance, cyber, privacy, and security. <laughs> and when he was at WashU in St. Louis, he also was a secondary appointment at the School of Medicine's Department of Neurological Surgery. Yes, brain surgery. <laughs> um, a former commissioner of U.S. International Trade Commission from 2013 to 17, he was nominated by President Obama and confirmed unanimously by the Senate. Since when does that happen in D.C.? Um, he has served as an advisor to high-level government officials during the Bush, Obama, and Trump presidency um, on national security and economics. Again, since when does that happen um, in D.C.? Um, he also recently launched Key Strategies LLC, where he brings together academics, former government officials, and business practitioners for collaborative, engaged, complex challenges facing private sector firms and technology, finance, business, and law. This makes us question, is he two or three um, people? Maybe, maybe four. Uh, uh, a former law clerk to the U.S. Circuit Judge Giles S. Rich, he was recognized as one of the nation's top 50 under 45 by magazine IP Law and Business. He was elected to the European Academy of Science and Arts. He studied molecular biology and microeconomics at MIT and went to law school at the University of Pennsylvania. As usual, Scott is ever the underachiever. <laughs> so there is Artie's bio of Scott. Here is Scott's um, bio of Artie. Artie Rye is the Elvin R. Laddie Professor of Law and Faculty <coughs> Director of the Center for Innovation Policy at Duke Law. She is internationally recognized expert in IP law, innovation policy, administrative law, and health law. Rye has also taught at Harvard, Yale, and the University of Pennsylvania Law Schools. Rumor has it that she also would have been asked to lead Starfleet Academy if the well-wishing Vulcan's hand gesture for long life and prosper hadn't accidentally been counted as three votes. It's a common <laughs> problem from the Vulcan. Um, Rye's current work funded by the Greenwald Foundation focuses on the intersection of trade secrecy incentives and explainability in AI-enabled healthcare delivery, once again demonstrating that there's nothing artificial about her high intelligence. From 2009 to 2010, Wright served as the administrator of the Office of External Affairs at the USPTO. She clerked for the Honorable Muriel Hall Patel at the Northern District of California, was a litigation associate at Jenner and Block, and was a litigator at the U.S. Department of Justice's Civil Division. 
Scott, who really, I think, figures out how I do all this evil twin stuff, notes that this year both of our evil twins somehow managed to work at the same law firm, Jenner and Block, and across many of the same parts of the government like the PTO. I don't know how you figured that out. This is how I set this up every year. Um, uh, it's a deep dive, Scott. Congrats. Um, so, Rye regularly testifies before Congress and relevant administrative bodies. In 2013, she was elected to the ALI. She won the World Technology Network Award for Law in 2011. And she was so kind in stepping aside from this year's Kennedy Center honors to allow Lynn Manuel Miranda to get a moment in the spotlight. We appreciate it. That's very kind gesture. Uh, Rye graduated from Harvard College, magna cum laude with a degree in biochemistry and history, I attended Harvard Medical School from 1987 to 1988, and got her JD from Harvard Law in 1991. As Yoda might say, I just don't have a Yoda voice here, underachieving started young in that one. And <laughs> uh, Scott's, um, okay, so uh, now the substance. Um, uh, so, Artie, I'll let you take it away uh, for uh, right. 18 minutes. All right. Well, thanks so much to Chris and the University of Richmond and Texas A&M, and I think there are other Chris authors as well. So thanks to all of you for, for this. This is a lot of fun, and I love to talk about the PTO's role in patentability. I'm sorry, Chris, but I'm going to take the boring view that the PTO should neither be a death squad nor a rubber stamp. <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> I do think the PTO does have a robust role to play in determining patent validity. And I think this is one of these happy cases where the consequentialist policy rationales comport pretty well with legal doctrine. And so policy and doctrine go well together. I'm going to focus most of my argument on the death squad piece, the PTAB. Uh, so former Chief Judge Rader famously called the PTAB the death squad. And that's where a lot of the action seems to be these days. The Supreme Court can't seem to get enough of the PTAB. Yet another case on the PTAB this term. Two cases just on the PTAB last term. It's really insane that they are that excited about this, this particular sub-institution within the PTO. Um, I think, on the whole, PTAB is clearly better than Article III courts for determining patent validity. And it's particularly true now, it seems to me, that that some of the, since some of the procedures have been improved of late. Uh, I'll also talk a little bit towards the very end about how it might be a good idea in the general PTO ecosystem to devote more resources to ex-ante examination, whether through applicant self-selection into more rigorous examination, or maybe better resources for all examination. That's a, a tiny bit of the argument. Uh, but. In the main, I'll talk about PTAB. And then finally, I'll close with something that I know, again, sorry, Chris, um, where Chris, Scott may actually agree with me, uh, and I don't know, but he just might. And that is that the PTO has a particularly interesting role to play in one substantive issue, it seems to me, and that's the issue of patentable subject matter, um, Section 101, where it seems to me the courts <coughs> have created a lot of confusion, and, it seems, and what the PTO is doing, from my standpoint, is illuminating. So let's start with the PTAB. So before we get to the legal issues, I want to talk about the policy rationale behind the PTAB uh, creation, because I was, being as old as I am, involved starting in the early aughts in the policy debate regarding why we needed a PTAB. And then I did specific policy analysis of legislative proposals when I was at the PTO in 2009 2010. So what was the problem? The problem, it seems to me, can be boiled down into a few statistics. Starting in the year 2000, something very interesting began to happen, in part because of lowered patent eligibility standards, other things that were going on, but also because the patent system was getting more globalized. Prior to that time, for about 25 years, the number of US patents in force, that is the number of um, US patents where maintenance fees are being paid, and therefore we're still in force, hovered around 1 to 1.2 million. Since 2000, and my latest numbers are from 2016, we've seen a 270% increase. So we're now at 2.78 million as of 2016. And Alice and Mayo did not really have much impact on that number of patents in force. During that time of 278% increase, 
there have been precisely 12 new district court judges added from 651 to 663. That's less than 2%. And meanwhile, the Supreme Court has said all of these 2.78 million patents are entitled to a very strong presumption of validity. Clear and convincing evidence has to be shown in order for these patents to be overturned, and of course that can be very costly when it's in millions of dollars, particularly if we're talking about juries being involved. So the exception has been, in recent years, these so-called patent eligibility challenges, which can sometimes be disposed of more quickly, but I don't think patent eligibility, and I don't think I'm unique in thinking this is the case, at least among patent lawyers, has been a particularly illuminating way of clarifying the doctrine. Um, so all that means that courts don't really test validity in a proper way, it seems to me. And that would be okay if the PTO did a perfect job, but I think no matter what your point of view in the PTO, whether you think it denies too many applications or grants too many, it's unlikely that you think it does a perfect job. The difference for wrongful denials is, of course, there's the possibility of appeal. And appeal has been pretty much de novo at the federal circuit. In contrast, there's no opportunity for someone who wants to challenge a grant to challenge, or at least there was in part of the PTAB, unless it was asserted in court against them, hence the need to um, spend all that money to challenge. And the sheer number of patents that are issued each year, of course, makes the, the challenge of 2.78 million continue to be daunting. It's about 350,000 patents every year. So all in all, the PTAB solves a real problem that exists because of this huge installed base, if you will, of patents that continues to grow. I think that's the policy rationale that makes a lot of sense. It also happens to be a, a perfectly legal way of doing things. And there, the Supreme Court, in an opinion by Justice Thomas, agreed with the argument several of us made in an amicus brief. Um, and so the functional arguments and the constitutional rule of law arguments go together nicely, it seems to me, in this case. We can talk about details of Justice Thomas's view, but I largely agree with his view for seven justices in the oil chips case. Okay, so all that said, I do think that the procedures at the PTAB need improving, and there have been uh, improving. Uh, I've argued in print and also in comments filed to the PTAB that the different claim construction standards that the PTAB has used historically was a bad idea, and Sarah bush who's in the audience, led a group of law professors, including me, that said they should change the Phillips standard, and they did. So now they have the, the, the appropriate standard for, uh, for substituting, essentially, their expertise for the lack of expertise of the district court. Sarb and I have also argued, and others have as well, that the PTO could do a lot more at the PTAB to reduce, uh, uh, to improve efficiency at the PTAB and provide safeguards against harassment. And I think it's done quite a bit in the last few years, particularly through a September 2017 opinion called General Plastics that we can get into if people are interested in the details. Third. Just recently, the PTAB has addressed the concern, well, two concerns, really, about inconsistent opinions being issued by its panels and also so-called panel stacking. It has done so through a standard operating procedure policy change that ensures a consistency across the PTAB and also really puts the PTO much more in line with conventional principles of administrative law, where administrative judges make the initial adjudicatory decision, but then it's reviewed by a political actor. That's straightforward conventional administrative law. I don't think anyone could argue there's a due process problem with that. Now, the PTO did do some weird things in a changing its standard operating procedure and saying that that's not the only way they're gonna run the show, which I'm not as happy about, but the presidential opinions panel that they've set up is clearly the right way to go from even the most formalist perspective on due process. It also addresses any concerns that the director is making policy by stacking panels. 
to the contrary, the way that it's the POP is set up, it's exactly how all agencies that have administrative adjudication do things. I also think, even though I disagreed with the result in SAS versus Iancu, for as a matter of statute interpretation, I thought there should be Chevron deference to the interpretation given by the PTO. I think on balance, the result is probably a good thing. And it seems to me that it will lead to greater efficiency uh, in the way that the process is run as a substitute for district court litigation because we won't have these partial institutions that create, it seems to me, on the whole, inefficiency. So that's the PTAB. I have five minutes more to talk about the other two places where I think the, PT uh, the PTO can play a really important role. I've argued in print that there should be more done ex ante as well. So in particular, I've argued that maybe in applicants should be able to self-select into a more rigorous system of ex ante review that would exempt them from post-grant administrative review. And this would be a voluntary self-selection. This would help to deal with the problem that we're facing right now in a bunch of federal circuit cases where, particularly in the biopharmaceutical industry, our applicants are seizing upon a piece of Justice Thomas's opinion in oil states and saying that there is a procedural due process and takings problem with applying inter partes review, quote unquote, retroactively to their patents. Now, I happen to think their legal argument is probably not a good one, but as a policy matter, one can see why there might be a problem with taking away a patent 15 years, say, after the fact. Uh, and so the self selection into ex ante rigorous review would be, it seems to me, as a policy matter, a good thing. Now, whether Congress would have to do that or the PTO could do that on its own. I think Congress would probably have to do that, so that's a little bit high in the sky, given where we are at Congress these days. But uh, I think it has merit as a policy proposal, at least. The other thing, uh, other proposal that has merit, seems to me, is um, the proposal that's been put forward and rigorously and empirically defended by my colleague Michael Frakes and his co-author Melissa Wasserman on improving the, um, or uh, giving examiners more time to examine patent applications. Okay, now finally, 101, and as I said, I hope that Scott might agree with me here. Just, I think last Friday, so to, uh, yesterday, um, the PTO released some 101 guidance that probably uh, scales back Mayo and Alice very significantly. Um, even though it purports to be in consist, uh, perfectly consistent with Mayo analysis, it says that if a claim is not is integrated with a practical application of a judicial exception, it's Mayo step one. And I apologize for the um, shorthand for those of you who don't know Mayo analysis. It automatically passes at step one, and we're done. Now, some of you may be a little surprised by the, that because. You know, that's sort of assertive behavior. But I think that's actually not necessarily a bad thing for the PTO to put forward and, you know, run it up the flagpole and see, see what happens. Now, I'm not sure it will survive, but I think it's a, not a bad proposal on the whole from my standpoint. Um, it seems to me 101 has not been a stunning success, and the PTO has some ideas on how 101 could be done better. Um, and simultaneously it re released Section 112 guidance, I think not coincidentally to say that we're not going to be so harsh on 101, but we are going to push you on 112, which is I think, exactly how it should be. So for all those reasons, I think the PTO has actually been a very responsible actor on the whole, um, both on a policy front and on a doctrinal front, probably more responsible than any other actor in the system. I would argue. Um, so for those reasons, I say yay to the PTO's role. <laughs> well, I cry foul. No fair. You did too good of a job. It made it too hard. Um, 
but in the spirit of, of striving on, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> um, uh, you, you threw out um, um, such red meat uh, in a good way on, on 101. You're right, I have to agree. <laughs> uh, but of course, I'm, I'm um, um, guilty as charged for having now 28 years ago argued that we should have IP rights in sports moves, including patents on sports moves, and then later ended up working for Judge Rich when he wrote State Street Bank. So, so I, you're right, my hands are tied, uh, locked in. Um, uh, so, violent agreement. Um, <laughs> I don't know about sports moves. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what a treat, uh, Artie, to, to share these ideas to, together and to uh, share them with each of you. We hope that this is a chance to engage in, in a thought experiment. Um, thank you so much to the organizers and to all of you for coming. And uh, hopefully, we can engage you in the debate uh, as much as each other. Um, on the on the very narrow question, death squad or rubber stamp, uh, you took the position neither. I take the position both. Um, <laughs> On, on uh, what, why, what comes, where does that come from? What I, what I hope to do is briefly lay out some ideas that are titillating, uh, controversial. Uh, uh, numbers always help. I love the million to 2.7 million uh, shift. That's, that's a powerful number. Um, I also think it's worth reflecting on some other numbers. Uh, in addition, um, then you have to decide for yourselves what significance to draw from all of these numbers. One thing to keep in mind is, uh, and this may just ultimately be a practical problem, a mere practical problem, um, um, but as long as the government shut down and they're fighting over budgets, it's a bit of a budget problem. The Patent Office is a big operation. Uh, it's a three and a half billion dollar operation. That's a lot of money. Um, it takes takes us uh, law professors teaching an overload semester to make that kind of money. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, think about what funds that three and a half billion dollars. Um, it turns out it's not patent applications. That's actually not where the PTO makes its money. Um, it makes its money on maintenance fees, most of its money on maintenance fees. At least it used to make most of its money on maintenance fees. After the 2011 American Vents Act, after the creation of the PTAB, the, the next biggest chunk of cash is running these new procedures. So I, I have a, a five and three quarters year old, almost six year old, uh, oh, so we read the Lorax. At the end of the Lorax, he hoists himself up and flies off. You can do that in Dr. Seuss land. But that's what the Patent Office is kind of doing with its budget, because it's eating itself, right? It's making money selling to you, people with interest in the patent system, its portfolio of patents to get rid of patents. It's, it's not a sustainable business model. That's, as a policy matter, by the way, maybe a good thing, or maybe a bad thing, but it's a weird thing. And it's just worth noticing. It's weird in several respects. One, why do we want this, I guess it's the opposite of a perpetual motion machine. Why do we want this um, happening? Um, in computer parlance, why not just go to Title 35, and if you're a, um, Mac user, Command A, if you're a Windows user, Control A, and then X, right? Just, just cut out Title 35. It would be a lot more efficient uh, to kind of just get rid of that system uh, than to have it pay to eat itself. That's a weird way to run the system. Um, here's another number. So Bloomberg, in those days, it was B&A still, um, was collecting data on Lobbying Disclosure Act, another statute, political law, the law that regulates money and politics. That, remember, in 2016 election became controversial because there was 
foreign money in domestic politics. But there's, there's been a lot of regulation of domestic political spending for a long time. And generally speaking, the Lobbying Disclosure Act is recognized as a one tool for publicly recording expenditures on particular areas of political activity. And Bloomberg had gathered up the 2011 numbers. Remember, the AIA was signed by the president in September. So this is a nine-month spend, right? Because once you have your statute, you stop spending on lobbying for your statute. So the nine-month spend in 2011 alone, as publicly reported through the LDA filings, $1 billion. Just kind of let that sink in. That is an effective presidential campaign, right? A billion dollars is what it takes to win the presidency of the United States. Still, it's gone up a little bit. It's now about 1.3 billion to win 2000, you know, the last election, the next one maybe 1.4. But a billion dollars gets you the presidency of the United States. And we, our society, spent close to that. We spent a billion in 2011 dollars on nine months of the AIA. A billion dollars. And the AIA, is, as already pointed out, was fought over politically for six, seven years. That's several presidential elections. Nothing in Washington can ignore that. Nothing at all. If you put iron filings down on a desk and you create a magnetic field Seven days of the week and twice on Sunday, those iron filings will line up to that magnetic field. That's just how it works. When you pour a billion dollars a year down K Street, everyone in Washington notices. Everyone on every side of the aisle pays attention. Everyone on every side of Capitol Hill and on both sides of Pennsylvania Avenue pays attention. And every agency and every court pays attention. So I think it's just important to recognize that that tidal wave of money was flowing down K Street for a long time, and the magnitude was enormous. Several presidential elections worked on just the patent stuff. So when I say both rubber stamp and death squad, what I really think is happening is the patent system we have is the patent system we bought. And it worked quite well for the folks who paid for it. And not so well for the others. That's an idea. It gets to be wrong like any other idea. You don't have to agree with it. But I want to try to convince you that it could be right. So here's what I worry about. I think that there are at least two ideas, and probably a lot more, but let me offer you two ideas for how you could use patents if you were a company. One way would be what I like to colloquially call the, the happy story, the beacon effect. The idea that patents facilitate commercialization. And in this happy story, and this might not exist, this might be total Dr. Seuss land, but hey, we're there, let's enjoy it. <laughs> so in this happy land, patents are not carrots for inventors to invent. Because it's really hard to figure out whether that bunny rabbit <coughs> an inventor is hungry today, whether she already had breakfast, whether she happens to be carrot intolerant, whether she sees a wolf lurking in the corner and the net incentive effect of this carrot is not gonna be enough. Yeah, I, I think in this happy story, Patents are wonderful tools for coordinating commercialization, precisely not as incentives to invent, but rather like a bright light turned on in a dark room. They are a beacon. They draw to themselves all of those who are interested in negotiating with each other. They <coughs> coordinate around the beacon. Who knows who controls the negotiation? Whoever happens to have the best bargaining power in the moment. It could be the inventor, it could be the venture capitalist, it could be the manufacturer, it could be the marketer, it could be the distributor, it could be the labor team, it could be the skilled labor team, it could be the unskilled labor team. 
Whoever's going to control that negotiation, we don't have to decide if we have a beacon model in our mind, but if we let this beacon effect occur, patents can be like a beacon in the dark, draw to themselves all of those interested in negotiating, they negotiate, deals get done or not, contracts are formed or not, planning is made or not, stuff happens. Under that story, I think patents work well for society by increasing the number of new business models coming to market and generally increasing distribution of patented technologies. Those are all empirical claims. They could all be wrong. Here's another story. It also could be wrong. I think it's a sad story. I colloquially call this the keretsu, or anti-competitive story. Let's imagine that Artie runs a big company, General Motors, and I run another big company in the exact same industry, let's call it Ford. And let's imagine that she's the CEO and I'm the CEO, and we pick up the phone and we talk to each other and we say, hey, um, let's split this market up. You know, I'll tell you what, I'll, get, I'll do the East Coast, you do the West Coast, uh, I'll do light trucks, you do cars, whatever. You see, if we have that conversation, we have two really serious problems. Well, the first one is, that's a criminal antitrust violation. We both go to jail, our shareholders pay treble damages, that's a problem, it's an antitrust problem. And then we have a trust problem. Why is she going to believe me? And why am I going to believe her? Because, by the way, we compete. Well, let's imagine we have large portfolios of patents. And we spend a decade or two litigating over thousands of patents. And publicly, we scream about 2.7 million patents and how expensive patent litigation is and how horrible the system is. And we fight in court for a decade. And while we fight in court, maybe I yield the light truck space a little bit. I just fight a little less hard there. But I fight a little harder on the cars, or the East Coast, West Coast, or whatever it is. What am I saying to her? That's the market I want. This is the market you can have. And I'm giving her a terabyte of data per case. And she's given me a terabyte of data per case. And just in case those documents are not clear, she's deposing my executives, my accountants, and I'm deposing hers. And that's all under oath. And even if I can't be in the room when her accountant's getting deposed, my outside lawyers can tell me they're at least telling the truth or not. We now have a high bandwidth, high trusted, long lasting communication channel going on in front of federal judges tried and true. And when we settle up and divide that market, even if the antitrust regulators kind of don't like it, it'll be a structural remedy. We'll have to rearrange our deal. But neither of us is going to jail, no mens reo. In fact, it's in front of the judge. It's, in fact, it's in front of 10 judges. It's quite out in the open. That patent system, I think, is the patent system we have. I think it's using patents for large companies to coordinate with each other and for large companies to coordinate with regulators, to say to antitrust regulators, food and drug regulators, uh, consumer safety regulators, hey regulator, uncle, I cry uncle, I agree I'm doing whatever you don't want me to do, so I will stop, I'll charge a lower price, but I'm also a good person. I'm inventive. So please give me a break in your regulatory regime. And how much of a break should you give me? I, I'm, I'm modest. I'm only going to ask for a break as measured by how inventive I am, my new contribution to society. And we're going to count that by my number of patents. You see what I did there? I'm not using patents to like beacons in the dark with predictable enforcement and contracts, I'm using beacons, as, I'm using my patents now as tools to negotiate with regulators where the regulators really have no interest in testing validity or infringement. They have no skin in the game. They have no specialized knowledge. They don't know the prior art. They're not getting sued for infringement. So counting patents is a good surrogate. They'll just give me an extra little bit of room on pricing. That's, I think, the patent system we've walked into. 
So I think we've walked out of beacons to commercialize innovation and walked into large numbers of patents and large numbers of patent wars in the name of decreasing the cost of litigation. Here's what I think I heard, which is we have a lot of patents on the books 10, 15, 20 years ago that were not good. Well, I agree with that. But I disagree that the PTAB was the right mechanism to solve that problem, and here's why. I think that I agree that the prior art, for example, and 112, are really good tools for disciplining that patent portfolio of, let's call them, bad patents. I disagree that the PTAB's the best mechanism. <coughs> here's what I think is a good mechanism, a mechanism where two things are going on. One, let's talk about the adjudicative process, and two, let's talk about the adjudicative body itself. The adjudicative process. When patent validity, patent infringement, patent remedy, and anti-competitive effect, when those four topics are simultaneously in play in a fight, everybody in the fight has incentives to be less hyperbolic. Why? Here's why. I'm a patentee, and I'm asserting a patent against you, and I know that infringement is the only topic on the table. I have a selfish incentive to tell everybody all the time, forever, that this patent covers everything and everything's infringing. And the exact opposite is true. If I'm attacking your patent, and I know that only validity over the prior art is on the table, <clears throat> right? Now your patent covers everything. That's why it's invalid. But when validity and infringement, when remedy and anti-competitive effect, when those are all on the table at the same time, the patentee and the alleged infringer each have their own selfish, self-disciplining incentive to be more moderate and less hyperbolic in how they present their argument and how they present the evidence. Similarly, the judge, the adjudicators, are confronted then with a complex set of information with self-limiting principles rather than abstract concepts that patent's just too big or it's just right or it's too small. So let's also talk about the adjudicative body. I agree that administrative law as a matter of practice and constitutionality works as you described. And my concern is a prudential one, that why do we want that to be operating in this setting? Put differently, I was at an agency that was structured by design in the shadow of the Civil War because we recognize, remember, the executive branch of the United States is designed to be politically responsive. And remember, most of the so-called independent agencies, the FTC, the SEC, the FCC, they're New Deal agencies. They're designed to be politically inclusive, but to still be quite politically powerful. They have a chair who can, and usually does, sit for the term of the president, or as fashion may come, be removed at the pleasure of the president, <laughs> um, backed up by a majority, they're an odd number commission. Well, the ITC grew out of a different time. And while we all absolutely wish we had killed each other over slavery, unfortunately, that wasn't enough. It was the politics of tariffs plus slavery, plus some other stuff that drove us to the Civil War. And the ITC was structured after the Civil War to address that narrow question of the politics of tariffs, not the slavery part, but it was designed to address the politics of, of tariffs by creating a six-member. What's so magical about six? Well, the only difference is six is an even number, but that's the magic. A six-member commission with a chair required by statute to rotate person and party among the sitting commissioners every two years, regardless of what the president does. So you've got a group of decision makers 
designed not to be politically responsive, rather than a group of decision makers designed to be politically responsive, adjudicating in the face of four buckets of arguments designed to be more analytical and less hyperbolic. So I offer that as a contrasting decision-making venue. It, by the way, is just as fast as PTAB. It's more expensive overall than PTAB, and we can talk about that. So I will wrap up by just offering that as a concrete alternative structure that I didn't invent, that other people invented, um, but they invented precisely to create that kind of, dare I say, restrained collaborative decision-making process rather than highly administratively power dynamic driven process. That's inherently how the executive branch works. Thanks. Great. So, well, so I think that in some respects we have some violent agreements, which scares me a little bit. <laughs> um, so, with respect to the patent office eating itself and perhaps creating this Karetsu type mechanism, I do have some concerns along those lines as well. And I think that one of the reasons it seems to me that ex ante scrutiny should be on the table, greater ex ante scrutiny should be on the table is because we don't want a situation where the patent office is supported by either maintenance fees, which lead it to want to grant patents, or PTAB, which I think is more neutral, but does create this system where you only get ex post review. So the difficulty that I see and the challenge is that we still consider patents as beacons for the most part in the United States. Other countries have a much more strict ex ante examination, in particular Europe is often cited, and that's because they don't, they think that it's not important to let everything in and let maintenance fees sort it out. They think it's more important to do the examination up front. We haven't reached that conclusion in this country, at least yet. I think it would probably be a good idea if we did. I still would have the PTAB as the alternative ex post mechanism, and we'll get to that in a minute. But I think, yes, that it would be good if we saw patents not uniformly always as beacons, but sometimes as strategic tools that could lead to Karetsu type maneuvers. And ex ante, stronger ex ante examination, I think, would reduce the Karetsu piece and increase the beacon piece, um, frankly. So that's on the Karetsu versus beacon and the patent system eating itself. On, I have one minute on the adjudicatory body. So. The ITC is an interesting beast because it does get to decide everything. Um, now, I think that it would be very difficult as a constitutional matter. I would, in principle, love to give infringement also to the PTAB. Um, I think as a constitutional matter, it would be very difficult to take infringement away from the jury. Um, we'll, we'd have to see um, whether that would fly, but I sent, and my guess is it wouldn't fly. Um, whether it, you know, it would be better in principle to have an independent agency do it versus an executive branch agency, well, there things get interesting. I think both executive branch agencies and independent agencies, well, some would argue that independent agencies are just unconstitutional, um, but leaving that aside, I don't think they're unconstitutional. Um, and they have their pluses and minuses, and you know I can I can see the arguments on both sides. But unfortunately, for an executive for the PTO to do infringement analysis, I think would create some Seventh Amendment problems that would be difficult to overcome. And in general, I'm not a fan of the Seventh Amendment in this space. So you know, what can I what can I say about that? That's just our constitution, I suppose. So thanks. I think I'm out of time, but this. Um, we ended up having some violent agreements, I think, which is, scares me a little bit, but that's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yep, yep.
so we so we have time for questions. Um, anybody have any questions for our twins? Mm-hmm. So we'll start the front row. Uh, Charlie, have a question for Scott. Um, so is there a microphone? Oh yeah, we do have a microphone. That's fine. Thank you. They're, um, they're recording it. Yeah, it's fixed. Should I use it? Yeah. yeah. Please. So my question is for Scott. Um, so your concern about um, the um, uh, patentee arguing a broad construction for infringement and narrow construction for validity, um, do you think that is um, mitigated at all by the recent change uh, so that now they're both using the same, uh, the PTAB and the district courts are both using the same claim construction standard, so um, they might be more likely to um, have the same claim construction and defer to whichever one construes it first. Um, so that might, do you think that might limit um, the patentee's ability to pursue different claim construction from different forms? Short answer is yes, but not enough. Um, because I think that the, the problem, as with most problems in life, um, is one of, that is entirely symmetrical in the system. So everyone's a bad actor and everyone's a good actor. It's not just the patentee or the alleged infringer. It's not just validity or infringement. It's not just remedy or, you know, my patent's so powerful, the remedy is a, a trillion dollars, oh, but it has no market power. Really? How did you get the trillion? Um, so, so I think um, <clears throat> the only way to really create the symmetrical tension to reduce the hyperbole is for both sides of the argument to have mustered their evidence about their commercial interests and they, after they've mustered their evidence about their commercial interests, will then be selfishly coerced to be presenting more moderate arguments to the tribunal. So I think it's a what is the information problem, and how do you get it amassed and assembled and presented problem? And that takes time, and that takes money, and the presence of all of those issues. Does that help? Yes, thanks. Okay, so uh, my question is uh, inspired by something already said near the, the end of, uh, of, of rebuttal, and it's directed to both of you. I'm interested in the comparison to EPO, right, because um, Benoit Battistelli and many others who represent the EPO in sort of multilateral discussions are very fond of talking about EPO patent quality and always sort of winking and nudging and saying, hey, it's so much better than U.S. patent quality, and the implication always seems to be that it's more rigorous examination, uh, more, you know, sort of better searching, these sorts of things. But there's also a lot higher filing fees, much more frequent maintenance fees, even ex ante, and there's simply a very, very costly screen to get in. And I think that properly reflects European attitudes about what the barrier to entry should be and the proper role of patents in what might otherwise be called in the U.S. the democratization of access to capital and, and the innovative market. So what do you think about whether that's an appropriate account of things and whether that's you know, the right way to think about it or whether Europeans have it right? So, I think descriptively you're absolutely right, and I think as a, as an empirical matter, we just don't know. Notwithstanding that, I think Scott, you've now bought into the currency view of patents as opposed to the beacon view, um, which surprised me. Uh, uh, I, I think it, it, it's probably both in different contexts for different reasons, and you know. Uh, there are definitely, uh, there's empirical evidence that would suggest that sometimes patents are beacons for attracting <laughs> venture capital and so forth and so on. So Deepak Hegda and, and, and those folks um, have, have contributed to the, the claim that there is a bright side to patents. Um, and it's not just all correct all the time. So, uh, and we still believe that in the US, whereas the Europeans just don't. and. Um, the costly screen principle is one that some academics have, Jonathan Mazur and others, have suggested, but we don't we don't have that in, 
the United States is a descriptive matter. And I don't know if the empirics will ever kind of be so definitive that we can say that we do it better or the EPO does it better, although I have a, a sense that we could probably shift the balance a little bit. Um, I think even despite the AIA, it's still mostly maintenance fees that are supporting the PTO, and that, I think, creates obvious problems. Yeah, and then just to add some additional thoughts, um, as I agree with much of what's been said by both of you. Um, <clears throat> look, it is, it is long, Justice Breyer wrote about this back as an academic, but, it, but it's long been kind of noticed <laughs> that um, there are a number of elements of the European administrative state that just work better than ours. I mean, there are a lot of theories about why that is. Um, uh, you know, the Germans will tell you that they are a big reason the EPO works the way it does. Uh, the Dutch have a slightly different take. You know, they're too great. Um, but but um, but it I think is gener it is it is a generally recognized phenomenon that parts parts of the administrative state work better in Europe than they do in the United States. Um, and I think that that's what's driving or explaining um, the characteristics you both were highlighting. Um, you know, there are a number of ways to harness some insights from that for our system. So for example, you know, outsourcing examination and allowing um, uh, governmental markets or private sector markets to, <coughs> to work to test validity. I happen to be a big fan of that testing. I happen to think generally it worked not terribly back in the day when evil patentee would knock on my door and say, hey bub, I'm putting you on notice for infringement. And, and I would say, so kind of you to knock. Please come in, tea, crumpets, and while you're eating, check out this piece of prior art I got. Because, you know, I'm pretty sure you assert that patent against me in the face of that. Rule 11, you're paying my attorney's fees. But by all means, sue me tomorrow. Look forward to it. You see, it seems to me that is another way to harness those incentives. And it is hugely imperfect, and it goes through that horrible thing of litigation. But look, you know, civil litigation is not that horrible. It's like democracy. It's messy and terrible, except less messy and terrible than everything else. And, you know, if we want, I can give you fast adjudication. Just give me a coin. I'll flip it. It won't be fair, and it won't be accurate, but, but you know, it'll be fast and cheap. Um, I don't think we want that out of our adjudication. I think what we want, what Rule 1 of the Federal Rules teaches us is, you know, we want a lot. We want it to be well informed, we want there to be process, we want there to be participation. In order for that to happen, we need evidence. In order for that to happen, we need discovery. Uh, you know, you want cheap, you get cheap. I'm not sure cheap is what we want. And there I would disagree. I think that here um, expense doesn't correlate with accuracy particularly well in civil litigation. Yeah. And Unfortunately, I think in the U.S. system, that's true not just in patents, but in medical malpractice and lots of different areas of civil litigation. Um, and we in the U.S. love our civil litigation, but we don't, I don't think, do it particularly well. We'll, we'll go to the, uh, the, the reception, but before that, so they can really remember. <laughs> I have a couple more. You can find me afterwards. You can have Jim a nice commemorative. Jim has three on his name. Uh, well, you have to really <laughs> find him for those, I think. Four. <laughs> um, so thank you so much, Artie. Thank, thank you, you so much, Scott. Thank you. Yeah.